It's the Mike Francesa Podcast on the Bet Rivers Network. Hello again, everybody, and welcome to the Mike Francesa Podcast on the Bet Rivers Network. And for all of your wagering needs, it's Bet Rivers in New York and New Jersey. Play Sugar House in Connecticut. Before we get to your uh, emails, a couple of things here. Uh, number one, the quick action from the Mets. You know, the Mets fans' reaction to the Grom was clearly emotional. And you got a lot of the same old Mets and, you know, Cone is this and he's that. And then obviously you saw that he's not anything of the above, Okay. Uh, they moved rather quickly and, frankly, overpaid for Verlander. But you can make the case for the next two years that although at his zenith, DeGrom is a better pitcher, Verlander is more dependable. That's all there is to it, especially in the long run. He is more dependable. Okay, that's just the way it is. You don't know how any of them are going to pitch in the World Series because Berlin has had his trouble in the playoffs of the World Series. DeGrom obviously didn't finish the season the way you wanted him to. But for the long run, Verland is going to be there and he's going to fit in. He ensures they have a relationship, obviously. Uh, you have two elderly, by major league standards, superstar pitchers. But... They made the move that compensated for the, what their loss was. And let's be honest, I have no problem with the way they handled the crumb, as I uh, mentioned. When you have a pitcher who's only thrown 38 starts in the last three years, it is very difficult to give him an astronomical amount of money and, and big years. It's just crazy. So Texas took a gamble. It is a gamble. All pitchers are gambles, but short term, I think you can count on Verlander to be there. Now let's see if he, in the big spot, lives up to what you want, which means when you get into the same game next year that he pitches the game that gets you to advance. That's all you're looking for. You're looking to advance. So, He'll you'll get back to the next spot, and they'll build a team that will get him to the postseason. And then you'll see what happens uh, from there. The Mets have some other questions to answer. They have some holes to fill. I think they uh, – I thought in retrospect the one move that they uh, missed on that could have really made a big difference was Real Muto. I don't know what it would have taken to get Real Muto here. I don't know if he even wanted to come to New York. But I would have made a bigger play at the time on Real Muto, and the Mets got so little out of their catching, and Real Muto is such a good player. Uh, I thought that's the move that could have changed things for them as a matter of the season as far as that's concerned. I thought that was the move that really could have uh, enhanced things uh, for the Mets, but there's many, you see, there's, there's a million different ways to do these things. I mean, just like if, as everyone sits on pins and needles now and waits for the word on judge, and it's comical to watch all these people jump the gun so that they can say, Oh, I had it. I had it. Nobody has it. Nobody has it because they don't know what he's doing yet. So to jump, to act like you have it now is nonsense. But people are out there, you know, I, I hear this or I think this or I do it. Hey, they'll be wrong 20 times before they're finally right when somebody's right because of the fact that he clearly hasn't made up his mind yet. When he does, we'll see where he goes. It looks like it's very much a kind of 50-50 proposition between the Giants and the Yankees. Let's see what happens. We don't know what's going to happen yet. But to me, if Judge goes to the Giants, it is not the end of the world. They have not won championships with him. They will be able to utilize the money that they saved by not paying him and go out and build a different team, and it might be better. Clearly, it's not going to be any more disappointing than the team that Judge has played on, and I'm not criticizing judge here i'm just telling stating a fact 
And there's some things about this team I have not liked. Like it always being over, overly, overly laden with sluggers who are one-dimensional or it being overly right-handed. I don't like those things about this team. Never have. It's not Judge's fault. I mean, he had an incredible season. He's an incredibly talented player. No one can take that away from him. He's one of the true stars of the game. doesn't mean you have to have Judge to win. You don't. They could lose Judge tomorrow and have a much better season next year. It's just the way it works. So don't think if it happens that all is lost. You almost get that feeling. I understand there will be an emotional hit. And some Yankee fans will go absolutely crazy, but you know what? The sun will come up the next morning. And they'll move on. And they'll move on with plenty of options. All right. Your emails, Mike Francesa uh, at Mike Francesa Podcast at gmail.com. That's where you send them. And we'll get to as many as we can. The Giant game got flexed. I told you weeks ago you were going to see games being flexed, and a lot of it was going to center on the NFC East. It already has, uh, with the Giants and Washington being moved. Imagine the Pats being moved down, but, hey, that's what happens. You're going to see other teams that you never see get moved down, get moved down in the next couple of weeks. That's what happens. It's a different season. You don't have the Pats in the mix. You don't have the Packers in the mix. And the Giants and the rest of the NFC East are all very much in the mix. All right, Audie in West Orange. I contend that an NFL division winner with a losing record hasn't earned a thing. Would you agree that if that is the case, the playoff spot should be forfeited to the next best record? No. I don't. I think that's utterly ridiculous. Hey, there are going to be years where teams in a division are going to have a rough season and be 500 or maybe even, heaven forbid, be a little under 500. It doesn't change things. We've seen those teams go into the postseason and play well. We've seen those teams go into the postseason and rock the boat. So to me, it doesn't mean a thing. So this year, you're going to see, and, and, and let's be honest, Tampa Bay, I, Tampa Bay pulled out a gift last night. New Orleans, as I tweeted, New Orleans, from when they were at midfield, after they forced the punt, and Brady didn't want to punt, and they decided to punt, and they got the ball back with six and change at midfield with a 16-3 lead. From that point, their coaching, their play calling, their coverages, their clock management was some of the worst I have ever seen. It was pitiful how badly they performed in that time. Number one, what are you doing throwing the ball on that first series at third and one? It's third and one. Run the ball. Now you've got the, another good chunk off the clock, and you can you might have got the first down, which you didn't on the third and one pass, or you might have decided there to go if it was an inch with Hill or, or two inches on fourth down. You get a first down there. The game is over. Over. You're going to at least kick another field goal to go 19-3, and three, to go up 19-3, or you're going to take three or four minutes off the clock. It's over right there, right there. Not to mention how many other big mistakes they made, including their having a 30-second possession the next time they got the ball and 
then not using their timeouts when they realized that Brady was going to, and you should have realized that once he scored the first touchdown and he had passed midfield with the ball again, he was going to score. He's Tom Brady. You have to use your timeouts and give yourself a chance to kick a field goal. Instead, you let him do it with three seconds left and give yourself nothing. I mean, I understand it's a first-year head coach. It's embarrassing how badly they managed that game. They Listen, Brady did what Brady does. He gets hot. He dinks and dunks. He probes. At that point, he's got the defense backing up. He's got the defense tiring. He doesn't let you get people on the field, and he just dinks and dunks and probes. You got six deep backs in the game. He runs the ball. You got, you got this. He dumps it here. He dumps it there. He throws it here. He throws it there. The bottom line, he's a master at that. He's been doing it forever. After having nothing in the way of any offense all night, he got the gift of all time. But that game should have been over seven ways from Tuesday. It was just absurdly badly managed from that point on, from when I gave you. When it was 16-3, Saints had the ball, six minutes and 40 seconds left at midfield. Shame on them. But now you have, instead of a team two games over 500 leading a division, you have a team at 500 leading a division. But would I disqualify teams for not finishing 500? Absolutely not. Mike emails, why do you think a great coach like Don Shula was unable to win a Super Bowl with Dan Marino? The Marino-Shula combination. The fact that it did not have postseason success. The fact that it did not win a Super Bowl and only went to one is one of the great mysteries of all time. You know, Marino has been criticized unbelievably. People have gone back and done work on the fact that, you know, this is a guy who did not have a good Super Bowl against a great Niner team, the best Niner team ever, according to Bill Walsh. Um, The year he lost the Super Bowl in just his second season. He played in very few championship games after that. He was 8-10 and 10 in the postseason. And according to, if you use the way games are broken down statistically, Marino should have won five playoff games. He won eight. So he actually elevated based on performance. They had no running game in the games he played. And his defense in the losses uh, averaged, I think they they averaged 34 points against his team in the 10 games he lost. They had no running game and no defense. So he actually went in without a talented team. If he had gone in with a team like Tom Brady had or a team like Joe Montana had or a team like Bart Starr had, he would have won Super Bowls. He didn't do that. So instead, he is much maligned, and frankly, it lessens his status where he should be regarded as one of the handful of greatest quarterbacks of all time because he was clearly that. He gets moved down the list because he didn't win a Super Bowl. Todd Man- and Manahawken says, I-, I feel that Grom kind of owed us considering he hadn't pitched in uh, two years and then came back and the fans celebrated his return. At this point in his career, coupled with the richest owner in sports, who most likely would have ripped up his contract had he proven that he could be healthy and effective. Uh, listen, he didn't go to baseball Siberia. He went to Texas, which is trying to rebuild, which is spending money, which just hired a very talented manager. He got a tremendous amount of money, which is his prerogative. I never, ever get on players for going to another spot. They have their reasons. They have earned free agency. They're not tied to one team or another. You don't owe any team anything. When you put in your service, 
All right, if you want to say DeGrom didn't pitch enough for the Mets. Okay, that's just that. When he went to the mound, did he give you a good performance? The answer is yes. He sometimes gave you an insane performance. Many times gave you an otherworldly performance. So you got everything that you could have gotten, and he gave you everything he had. He just missed a lot of games. If he didn't, he would have been on a different planet as a pitcher because the absence was the only thing that held him back. But it's his prerogative to leave for greener pastures, for more money, for better uh, situations. I don't think DeGrom was overly happy here. Just like I wouldn't be surprised if we hear that George wasn't overly happy here. So what? If that's the case, so what? That's the way that's the case. If he wants to go to San Francisco, God bless him. I say he has every right to do that. I would never begrudge any player for doing that. At the end of 2015, many Mets believed that the young rotation, Harvey DeGrom, Syndergaard, uh, Wheeler, and Mass, would make the Mets competitive for years. The group is now completely gone, and the Mets have very little to show for it. Are the Mets justified in feeling extremely disappointed that the organization was not able to better capitalize on the opportunity? Yes, but hey, pitching is highly, highly volatile. Injuries, up and down performances, all different things that come into play. Who knew Harvey was going to completely fall apart and have two of the worst injuries that a pitcher ever had? Who knew that the Grom was going to miss as many games as he did? That wasn't as good as they hoped. Wheeler, they made a huge mistake on. Syndicard had his moments early and then didn't follow through and become the pitcher that they hoped he was. His career has been kind of disappointing since the early showing. The biggest mistake the Mets made was Wheeler. Great kid, could sign him for a reasonable amount of money, and he turned into a star. That's the biggest mistake of the group. But, hey, your plans with pitching rarely work out exactly the way you hope they would. That's the way pitching works. Dave and Poughkeepsie, what is your opinion of the NFL's my cause, my cleats? Um, hey, anything that the, play, that the league does or the players do that is charitable, that helps other people, that allows them to use their great, uh, you know, really enormity of riches, the attention that the league gets, the amount of money surrounding the league, the amount of money the league makes and the players make, if they can use that to help society and help those less fortunate, God bless. I mean, who, who would be against that? Nobody. Do you remember a more underperforming team than the Broncos this season? Oh, yeah, I can remember many. Broncos have been bad this year. The Wilson thing hasn't worked out. Uh, the... Hackett regime hasn't worked out. Hackett was brought in there, as I've told you many times, because they thought they were going to get Aaron Rodgers, and Hackett and Rodgers had a relationship, and then it didn't work. Then Rodgers wound up staying in Green Bay, and they went and turned around and got, and got Wilson, who was not happy with the way things were being done in Seattle, even though they had one big. He wanted the offense to run through him completely, and no longer be a run-first offense. And Carroll said, hey, it's not the way I do things. It's not the way we've won here. That's not who we are. Now, Seattle, which has shocked everybody by using Geno Smith, using a couple of kids to tackle, getting Walker to become a a really uh, tremendous first-year running back, has won seven games and surprised everybody, and Pete's one of the Coach of the Year candidates, but now he has been decimated by injuries. Walker has a bad, from what I understand, ankle injury. They lost three running backs in the game the other day. 
I don't know what they're going to do. They're going to have to have Gino just throw the ball to Metcalf and lock it a lot. Um, they don't really have a big time back anymore. Walker, they said, has suffered a strange, is the way they put it, ankle injury. I don't know what that means, but it doesn't sound like he'll be back anytime soon. Roger emails, do you kick Feliciano off the team if you're a uh, Dable? Um, Jimmy Johnson style, Parcell style. Well, their style isn't to kick a guy off the team that they need. Their style was, and Jimmy would explain to me, I would make an example of somebody I didn't need. So if a guy lacked discipline and he was no good, I get rid of him. Or I make an example of him to make sure I send a message to the rest of the team. Never with a player that they need, and the Giants need him. But what he did the other day was so patently stupid. I hate when guys make me plays that turn out to destroy the team. And that play did. That's a me play. And it was as dumb a play. And Parcells used to have a sign in his locker room about dumb players make dumb plays and dumb plays lose games. I'm paraphrasing, but that's basically the essence of it. And that's an example of it right there. That's just patently dumb. When you see a guy get a late hit after the whistle for no reason because he got into it with an, assu- uh, you know, an assistant coach on the sideline or he does the taunting play there after a key run that set up a second and one that could have changed the game. That would have won them the game. If Feliciano doesn't get hit with that taunting penalty, the Giants are going to win the game there. They're going to get time off the clock. They are going to get a two-score lead. In that game, that two-score lead would have held up. It was a critical, critical mistake, but I don't cut him if I need him, and they need him. Uh, what are your thoughts about the contemporary era committee and athletes getting another opportunity at the Hall of Fame? I don't like the idea of gimmicking the Hall of Fame in any way. I don't like the Veterans Committee. I don't like the Second Chance Committee. I don't like all the nonsense to put extra people in. They do it so that they can have uh, teams and days, days for the players in Cooperstown, get people up to Cooperstown, and also allow these teams to market and have days in their own building for the guy who makes the Hall of Fame. It's all about money. It always is. Every move they make in any way is about money. That's all it's about. And to me, it lessens or cheapens the idea. If you have a regular process to get into the Hall of Fame and you can't get in, then you don't belong to get in. The Hall of Fame is not something that anybody has a right to expect. You either get in or you don't. Case closed. You're either good enough or you're not. And you're going to tell me it's subjective? Yes, it's subjective. Anytime people are voting on something, it's subjective. But to me, that's what it's about. And if you don't get in, you don't have them change the rules until they start putting guys in who don't belong in the Hall of Fame. And that's what the Veterans Committee has done. It's put people who had not earned their way in and don't belong there into the Hall of Fame. And we all know there are players that or right on the edge, and that's frustrating, or like everyone, and I like Keith Hernandez a lot, you know, always have. Do I think Keith Hernandez is a, a Hall of Famer? Not necessarily, no. You know, it's a, it's a he played an offensive position. Now all of a sudden we're going to change it that it wasn't an offensive position. It was an offensive position. Guys at that position knocked in 100 runs every year and hit 500 home runs. He didn't do that. 
He wasn't that type of offensive player. Okay, great. He was a great defensive player. Yes, at a position that's not considered to be a defense. It's not shortstop. It's not catcher. It's not center field. So he's up against guys who hit 500 home runs. He's up against the Willie McCoveys and the Willie Stargells and guys like that. And he's not going to be able to compete with those guys. And you know what? If you're going to do it by being an average hitter, well, then you need to hit 320, 330, not hit what he hit. So I'm not singling him out in any way. And he was a tremendous player. It's not a knock for someone not to make the Hall of Fame. The Hall of Fame is for the 1%. Let's be honest. The Hall of Fame is for the Mickey Mantles and the Babe Ruths and the Willie Mays and the Hank Aarons. That's what the, and the Ty Cobbs. That's what it's for. And then there's always going to be borderline people. And where you draw the line. And we spend so much time not on the guys who belong in the Hall of Fame or who, who waltzed into the Hall of Fame. We never think about them again because they were no-brainers. We only think about the guys who were on the cusp or right there. Or, and did they belong or didn't they belong? And then we try to find a way to put them in. We spent 20 years trying to find a way to finagle them into the Hall of Fame. If you have to finagle someone in, maybe he doesn't belong. And it's not, not, you're not knocking a player for saying he was very good, but not immortal. Very few guys were immortal. Very few guys were, you know, Joe DiMaggio or Lou Gehrig. Those guys, we know, you go in on roller skates. So we, we really, in sports, spend so much time on the marginal Hall of Famer. Because, you know why? We like debate. That's why. We like arguments. We like debate. And Hernandez is good enough to debate. Phil Simms is good enough to debate. And that's why you do it. You can't debate, you know, Mickey Mantle. You can't debate Willie Mays. You can't debate Sandy. You can't debate Pedro. So that's how it works. And that's why... But do I like the idea of coming up with all these different ways to usher guys in the back door? No, I really don't. Recently, this is from Adam. You answered that what uh, you, something about your favorite all-time movie. Yes. Do you have a favorite holiday movie? Uh, in recent years, I've liked Love Actually, and that's almost considered a Christmas movie because of a couple of moments in the movie where the guy has the cards outside the door with the woman he thinks he's in love with or the big song scene in, you know, in the school play. Well, I want Christmas, you know, so it's been considered a Christmas, modern Christmas classic, but no, I don't have one Christmas movie uh, that I'm, you know, have to watch. Really, you know. I know I don't have one. There are there are really. Let's be honest. There are not a lot of great Christmas movies. There's a couple of standards. You know, everybody wants to watch It's a Wonderful Life. The bottom line is, I I, I really don't know. Fred, we know what his legacy in NBA history is with the accomplishments and championships as a coach and as an executive. And as an executive. But what do you think of Pat Riley's overall legacy in New York, the way he left, and his becoming a rival? Um, Riley did a great job with the Knicks. He made the Knicks the best show in this city. He made the Knicks matter a lot. 
In Riley's years, the Knicks were, they were the hottest ticket in town. And let's be honest, they came within an eyelash, an eyelash of winning a championship because they should have won game six in Houston. Without any question, they should have won that game. Game seven, you know, Kenny Smith had a bunch of shots and they got blown out when they waited around for game seven in the heat of Houston. But they should have won it in six. They could have easily won it in five. Easily. If not for, you know, a couple of guys coming off the bench and making a difference for Houston in game three. They could have easily won that in five games. And if they had won a championship, I think that is remembered for Ewing, for Riley, for Chekets. It's remembered far differently than it's remembered now. But for someone who lived that and lived it very, you know, closely, there all the time, doing shows after the game from the play-by-play for most of, I think, all four of Riley's years. Um, it was special. And I've said this many times. I don't think anybody, anybody left a bigger void than he left when he left. He left an enormous void. He left shoes that were not going to get filled. And um, it's too bad he wasn't here for a decade. Really wasn't, because that that, that should have happened. I know he was someone who asked for a lot. But he was worth a lot. Richard in Connecticut asks, where would you rank Shea Stadium among, among the New York stadiums? Again, something I've never thought of. Um, I've always looked at stadiums as being part of each team's tradition, each team's, you know, sign. They, you know, they, they, that's, that's who they are. You have a couple of buildings that were iconic because they're in New York and because of the teams that played in them. Yankee Stadium is an historic building, one of the most historic in the world. Madison Square Garden obviously carried the name of the world's most famous arena. It's special. Those arenas aren't just, you know, national treasures, they're world treasures. And they're known the world. Yankee Stadium, Madison Square Garden are known the world over. They symbolize something. So you, everything changes from there. The Giants, you know, using stadiums, the Jets using stadiums, being an unhappy Shea tenant, the Yankees Giants and Yankee Stadium, then both going, obviously, to the Meadowlands. Um, I didn't like the symmetrical ballparks that were built in that era. But I think Shea fit the Mets in a lot of ways. And it was special because that's what housed their memories, and that's what a stadium's supposed to do or a building or an arena is supposed to. It's supposed to house your memories. And that's what it did. So there are different levels in New York, but to me, each team has their own home, and their homes are special. Some are a little more iconic than others, but that's just the way it works. We'll get back to you whenever Judge does make a decision, whatever day or moment that is. We will uh, deal with that and obviously look towards the football later this week. Enjoy your evening, everybody. Thanks for listening to the Mike Francesa podcast on the Bet Rivers Network.